And welcome to Advantage Radio Ministries Second Chances here at Lift FM. My name is Greg Hennis, and this is our weekly program that we have the opportunity and pleasure to bring each and every Tuesday evening uh, on the radio. And uh, we have such wonderful guests week in and week out. But you know something? It's wonderful to visit with the guests, but the number one reason this program is on is to A, encourage you, and B, most importantly, give you the opportunity, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the opportunity to accept Him into your life. And that is the case each and every week, and that's the number one reason this program is on, not only here on the radio, on Lift FM, but also on the uh, World Wide Web, liftfm.com, and uh, of course all the programs are archived at AdvantageRadioMinistries.org. And our guest today is Dr. Gary Lovejoy. He is the author of the book entitled Light in the Darkness, Finding Hope in the Shadow of Depression. And Dr. Lovejoy, I just have to start off by asking this question. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear the word love in a Christian uh, name, and you say, well, is that his real last name, Dr. Lovejoy? He's a Christian. Is that really your last name? It is my last name. I often... Uh... I often uh, joke with people that uh, I'm found in Scripture, because in Galatians 5.20 it says, For the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, <laughs> <laughs> And well, not only that, but I live in Happy Valley, uh, Oregon. So um, uh, when I ever, whenever I travel, they look at my ticket and they see love, joy from Happy Valley, and they look at me and say, Is this a joke? <laughs> 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 you can hardly believe it. Uh, that's good. And I tell them, Well, I'm a... I'm a therapist as well, and then they really look at me strangely. <laughs> I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do. Uh, Dr. Lovejoy, uh, I know you've been a, a professor of psychology and religion for over 32 years. Give us a little bit of background on who you are, uh, a little bit more about where you were born, if you are raised in a Christian home, and maybe you could even uh, incorporate a little bit of your testimony uh, in that uh, of how you came to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to. Um, I was uh, born in Long Beach, California, actually, in, in a Christian family, and uh, was actually raised in church, but, uh, but it wasn't until I was uh, seven years old uh, that I accepted Christ as my Savior. And, um, and I, uh, I remember very vividly in those, in those days um, uh, the, that it was music that brought me to Christ. Uh, uh, certain pieces of music would uh, convict my heart, and I eventually... Uh, realized that uh, I couldn't get away from the music, nor could I get away from God's uh, call. So uh, that's how I became a Christian. Um, I uh, went on and, and uh, graduated in psychology and, and got my Ph.D. in psychology, and then um, I also along the way uh, received a, a degree from Fuller Theological Seminary and, uh, and as well, and that enabled me to be able to teach both uh, psychology and um uh, uh, and religion courses in a secular institution, which was a unique opportunity. I was able to teach the Old and New Testament classes uh, there, and uh, it was a great privilege to teach them. And I taught both Christian and non-Christian uh, students together, which was quite a challenge and uh, a great opportunity. Uh, then <clears throat> I've also had a private practice uh, for the past 35, 36 years. Um, I established uh, uh, and founded uh, Valley View Counseling uh, Services, uh, and we have been working with uh, families and um, individuals, and pa- I do a lot of work with pastors and and uh, church leaders and missionaries uh, in, in their struggles uh, in life, whether it's with depression, which often is the case, or anxiety, or many other personal issues, maybe uh, do a lot of marriage counseling as well. So um, uh, it gives me a lot of opportunity uh, to do that. I've been doing a lot of writing in more recent years, and uh, not only this book, but I wrote uh, a companion book that actually goes with this, this book on um, Light in the Darkness, which is uh, aimed directly toward pastors. It's a pastor's guide to the shadow of depression, and I think, believe it's the first uh, book that's been ever written that uh, is directed directly to the unique circumstances of the pastors and how they have to, uh, what kinds of pressures that they deal with every single day and the sense of uh, isolation they often experience within the church in terms of dealing with their own individual problems. And uh, so uh, that was a great privilege to write. And so I, I uh, have a wide-ranging ministry, both in terms of uh, counseling as well as, uh, as opportunities to teach, and I speak in a lot of places as well. 
Uh, how long ago was it that you put out your first uh, published uh, work? Uh, well, it was 2009, and uh, it was that was a, a book on depression. This one is uh, another one. On, the reason that we uh, I, I've teamed with a, a primary care physician who specializes in antidepressant medications, and he's a Christian as well. And uh, the two of us uh, put on uh, depression seminars uh, called uh, Breakthrough uh, Journey Out of Depression, and um, and we uh, have conducted those all over the Northwest. And uh, we've uh, we've just encountered so many people in the church who are suffering, who are struggling with depression, and who often feel. Uh, uh, feel ashamed that they're depressed. They feel that uh, somehow depression is uh, is uh, is not acceptable for the Christian. That some how they make mistakenly think that good Christians are only happy Christians. That if you're depressed, it means that you somehow fail God and can no longer be used for the kingdom. And that faithful Christians have no justification for being depressed. However, if you read Scripture, and we share these in our seminars, that you discover how false these notions are, because most of God's most trusted servants in the Bible experience depression, sometimes even suicidal depression. Uh, servants like Moses and Elijah and Jonah and Job and Jeremiah and Samuel and David in the Old Testament, and of course the apostles uh, Peter and Paul in the New Testament, they all struggled with depression, but God did not reprove them for uh, lack of faith or a uh, uh, lack of following him but rather they gave, he gave them specific directions in his compassionate character to how to deal more effectively with their emotional struggles. So um, uh, it is a great privilege to be able to uh, address the issues of depression. And many, many people came forward and, and were relieved to be able to talk about their depression for the first time. So uh, we have a, I have a real heart for people, uh, especially in the believing community, who are struggling uh, in ver- with various uh, kinds of issues including uh, depression and anxiety, and, uh, and that's where uh, we kind of focused our ministry, uh, although I do an awful lot of marriage counseling, in which we find a lot of depression there as well. Well, certainly, uh, certainly the words depression, the words anxiety, as uh, you just can't help but uh, talk to people that are experiencing problems, those words usually come up, and uh, it just seems more and more of a common occurrence, uh, even recently, Nationally, the word depression came to light when the uh, revolution or revelation came out that uh, uh, the well-known actor Robin Williams, uh, of mm-hmm. course, committed suicide but had suffered from depression. Just another example of how many times you hear the word depression, anxiety. Those things are talked about over and over again, aren't they, Doctor? Absolutely. In fact, uh, when Robin Williams took his life, uh, there was a, a great deal of turmoil in, in uh, the wider community. I in fact, we had been called by a local radio station to to uh, uh, to make comment concerning his uh, his death, and uh, and oftentimes people who are high profile, we think they have their life together and everything is great. And of course, he always presented a a kind of hilarious facade, but uh, underneath, he suffered most of the time, and he admitted at one point in his life that that the only therapy he ever sought was uh, through the stage, and where he would live out an alternative uh, experience, which is what he really wanted to live but in his personal life was torn with the, his own sadness. It's interesting to say that, that uh, even in my own field in psychology, uh, one of the uh, founders of psychology was Sigmund Freud, who was uh, a very depressed man. Uh, he, uh, he was uh, brilliant, um, but at the same time, uh, he suffered depression for the majority of his life, and he spent most of his life predicting the end of his life. And uh, he didn't die until he was 84, but... Uh, but he even was for a while um, uh, took cocaine and other kinds of things because he said it, that life was too difficult to experience without some sort of palliative to uh, blunt the force of life. And and so there are a lot of depression is so widespread and and um, and a lot of people think uh, they're the only ones that are experiencing it because uh, they are not aware of just how widespread it is. But 19 to 20 million people in this country are experiencing some level of depression or not. Uh, of, of some kind, and then uh, as well as, uh, and this is an astounding statistic, um, that 70% of pastors, and study after study shows this, uh, 70% of the pastors are experiencing some level of depression. And, uh, and it may be one reason why you don't hear depression mentioned very often in the pulpit. You would think that uh, given the fact that depression and anxiety are the two most common emotional disorders mentioned in the Bible, 
uh, that they, you would hear a sermon from time to time on them, but you almost never do. But p- part of the reason may be that uh, many pastors themselves are struggling with this issue and feel, uh, some of them I know, because um, I've worked with them, feel ashamed that they are and they need not. Yes, yeah, certainly when you, you hear the word pastor, the next word you uh, don't expect to hear is depression uh, and those uh, two words back to back, that's for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And they, they, sen- they sense that, and they, that's why there was a pastor here locally that uh, was going through severe depression and, in fact, is ha- hospitalized, but the uh, message that was put out to the church was that he was sick, and, and so people were praying for him and didn't know exactly what was wrong. And then finally, one day he stood up in, his, uh, in the pulpit and admitted that he'd been struggling with severe depression and had been hospitalized for that. And after he did that, that moment of candor was an emo- amazing result in his church because many people came up afterwards and, and, uh, and expressed not only their compassion for him, but also shared some of their own stories of pain and opened up the church in a way he had never anticipated. We're visiting with Dr. Gary H. Lovejoy. He is the co-author of Light in the Darkness, Finding Hope in the Shadow of Depression. Uh, Dr. Lovejoy, who did you team up to uh, put this book out with? Uh, well, it is with uh, Dr. Gregory Knopf, and he is the uh, um, he is the physician I was referring to that uh, together we have put on these seminars. We actually wrote this book partly because uh, when people came up after our seminars and asking us, us to, uh, is there material that is related to the way we were talking about depression, and we discovered there really wasn't, so we decided to write uh, a book of our own. And so that's what we did, and that's how this book came into being. Mm. Uh, the book uh, obviously is is dealing a lot with darkness and and depression and, and different things like that. And, and speaking of depression, you refer to depression in the book as an uncomfortable alarm system designed to get our attention. What are some of the symptoms that uh, those suffering with depression could expect? Well, that's a very good question because a lot of people don't necessarily recognize that they're depressed. Um, there, of course, are feelings of sadness and emptiness almost every day, most of the day. Feelings of worthlessness and inadequacy, low self-esteem, in other words. Feelings of helplessness and hopelessness. Uh, these are all fairly apparent as far as uh, depression is concerned. But then there's also a loss of interest or pleasure in almost all activities. And a kind of loss of energy or a constant fatigue that people feel. Uh, that's one of the reasons why people think I must have some sort of low-grade virus or something. Uh, they often have social withdrawal. They don't want to be around people, or if they are, most of their relationships are socially dysfunctional. Then um, th- another key characteristic uh, is uh, insomnia, a difficulty either getting to sleep or staying asleep, or sometimes even hypersomnia where they're sleeping a lot of the time. Then there can also be uh, a loss of appetite, or its opposite, compulsive eating, binge eating. So they'll either gain a lot of weight or lose a lot of weight. Um, there can be excessive feelings of guilt, uh, most of it false guilt, uh, feelings of inefficiency, impaired ability to think, uh, known as marked by a kind of you know, indecisiveness and a lack of concentration, obviously feelings of anxiety, sometimes intense anxiety, and the physical symptoms such as bodily aches and pains, uh, again, that tends to uh, lend a person thinking they have some sort of uh, physical illness. And then they can be restless and hand-wringing and slowed speech and and then sometimes outbursts of anger, increased irritability, blaming others, exaggerated sense of frustration. We may think they have an anger problem, but in fact they very well may be depressed. And then, of course, uh, depending on its severity, it may also have recurrent thoughts of death and suicidal ideation. So these are the characteristics or symptoms of depression. And from a clinical standpoint, you need, about, um, you need to exhibit at least four or more of these that are necessary for a diagnosis of depression. Uh, many people fit that category from varying degrees, and it, it's on a spectrum level. In other words, it can go from either mild uh, to moderate to severe uh, expressions of depression. We're visiting with Dr. Gary H. Lovejoy. He is the co-author of Light in the Darkness, Finding Hope in the Shadow of Depression. Dr. Lovejoy, is there a website that one could visit to learn more about you, or what are the best places to uh, pick up a copy of this uh, book? Uh, yes, uh, there is. Um, uh, first of all, um, we have our own website. It's called uh, depressionoutreach.com, and uh, we have uh, many of our uh, our things, uh, both our philosophies and and our backgrounds, and some materials that are presented there. 
that people can, in fact, actually on that um, site, they can actually take a, a self-administered test and determine whether they, in fact, are depressed. Um, then there is also, uh, the book can be found in most of the bookstores, including Barnes & Noble and all the Christian bookstores, as well as on uh, WPHonline.com. It's uh, published by Wesleyan Publishing House, and that is their uh, website, product website. Um, and so it's available there as well. It's also available in, at Amazon.com. And so these are, there are many multiple opportunities for them to purchase the book in various uh, venues. And you said that website was DepressionOutreach.com? Yes. Okay. Back to the book, Doctor. Uh, what is the connection uh, between anger and depression? And is there a connection, I guess? Uh, yes, in fact, there is. That's a very good question. Uh, while anxiety is the, the fear of being hurt in some way, such as feeling you don't matter, uh, anger is the most common reaction to actually being hurt. You can deal with anger in one of four ways. You can either repress it, which is an un, uh, uh, unconscious psychological process where you simply drive down anger because it's unacceptable to you, or you can suppress it, which means that you know you're angry, but you're just driving it down underneath. Or you can express it, which means we let it fly and, and expressions of rage and whatnot. Or finally, you can confess it, which means um, that you talk through your anger with the person toward whom you feel it toward resolution. That, of course, is the most healthy uh, way of dealing with anger, but a lot of people have difficulty dealing with anger. And when we shove our anger under the rug, it goes underground as resentment at, at first and then can lead to bitterness and therefore significant depression. And so while anger is the acute uh, emotional alarm system that says that something is wrong, depression is the chronic emotional alarm system that says something is wrong and needs our attention. We're visiting with Dr. Gary Lovejoy, the co-author of Light in the Darkness, uh, Finding Hope in the Shadow of Depression. Doctor, you also suggest that depression is not only normal, it's also a part of our design. Can you explain that to us? Because that's not what uh, we would expect to hear. No, that's an excellent, uh, excellent question. Uh, depression, as I said, before, as we talked about a moment ago, is in reality a signal. It's an emotional alarm system that tells us that something is chronically wrong or missing, either within ourselves or in our relationships or possibly within our circumstances, oftentimes a combination of all three. And depression tells us that we need to attend to something that has damaged us in the past and is likely still damaging us in the present. And I often call depression as an instrument of our divine image to protect the integrity of that image. And you might ask, well, how can I say that? Well, partly because all alarm systems, though very unpleasant to experience, are always designed to protect us. For example, we have smoke alarms, fire alarms, intruder alarms, alarms in your car that you drove to work this morning. Uh, and many of these alarms, like if you ever had a true alarm go off in your home, it's extremely unpleasant to listen to. Uh, but the idea is to alert us. The idea is to make us aware that something needs our attention. Same thing is true, uh, probably the most powerful uh, physical alarm system we have is pain in our bodies. Uh, when pain is elicited, it's because it's telling us there's something wrong in our body and we need to pay attention to it. The same is true or uh, depression, and I often, we often have a saying that depression is to the psychological self as pain is to the physical self, because it has this important signaling function, and, is, and as an instrument of the divine image, it's designed to either protect it or to direct our attention to its repair. So in that way, depression is really not the problem, even though we feel it is because it's such a dreadful experience, but rather it's a signal that there is a problem. In that sense, then, depression is your ally, not your enemy. It's a clarion call to intervention and change. And so far be it that we become ashamed of such an important alarm system provided by a merciful God who desires, I think, uh, that we heal from the damage done to our person. Is depression, in your opinion, a result of uh, biology, environment, or your own choices? Uh, well, that's, a, that's another excellent question. Uh, we used to think in either-or terms, but now we think in both and terms. Um, the uh, causal factors can be predominantly one or the other. For example, in bipolar disorder, it's predominantly biologically determined. It's about 80% biological, about 20% environmental. The fact that it involves both means that both counseling and medication are important in uh, working with uh, people who have bipolar disorder or other um, biologically predominantly based uh, depressions, such as anything involving hormonal dysfunction, such as 
uh, perimenopausal depression or uh, postpartum depression and so forth. Um, but then there are other uh, depressions that are largely environmentally caused, such as the person's history, such as a case of physical or sexual abuse or neglect or parental discord, or, or by disruptions in relationships, such as marital discord or divorce, or the death of a loved one, or the loss of actually anyone with whom we have a high degree of emotional investment, or it simply can be the result of external factors such as uh, job stress. So uh, our choices have to do with how we elect to respond to these stressors that we encounter, whether they're internal or external. Uh, certainly we can make good choices as well as bad choices, choices which can play a major role in whether we become depressed or not. Uh, in other words, it's not merely the presence of stress that matters, but rather how we subjectively evaluate that stress that usually determines our resulting mood state. We know, however, though, that, that our depressive reactions to environmental events can cause a change in our brain chemistry, just as changes in our brain chemistry can cause a response of depression. In other words, it goes both ways, which is why it can be so complex and so difficult to sort out sometimes all the causal factors. That's why a trained therapist is often necessary to more precisely identify what's going on and why. In your book, you write that we must know God's voice in the darkness of our pain. How then can folks um, hear that voice when they are just so fixated with all the pain? Uh, another excellent question, um, because that's very true. People do get very fixated by their pain. I think this partly depends on your concept of God. If you see God as someone to fear like a dictator, then you may very likely see your pain as punishment by God. If you see God as a kind of accountant who legalistically determines the amount of good versus bad in your spiritual bank account, you will see your pain as evidence of your failure to please God enough. Uh, if you see God as, as distant and essentially disengaged, you will see your pain as a hopeless condition which God will simply ignore. Or if you see God as a rescuer, as many people do, you will see your pain as a mandate for God to do something about it. And if he doesn't, you are devastated and uh, oftentimes begin to question your faith. In each of these cases, your pain will merely further blind, me, blind you to the true nature of who God is. And as a result, you will sink into even deeper despair and in the loneliness of your emotional pain. But if, on the other hand, you see God in his wholeness as one who cares for his people, who, you will listen to his voice in the midst of your pain with the anticipation that he will teach you something more about himself or something more about yourself through your pain that he will grow you in some significant way. I remember a pastor, after we had worked, he'd been gone through severe depression, and uh, we uh, worked together for almost a year, and to, at the end he said, you know, I now consider my depression as God's gift to me. And I said, oh, really, why is that? And he said, because, he said, uh, it has softened the sharp edges of my personality. He said, I, I'm a softer person. I, I have more compassion for people who hurt now. And he had several people in his church come to him and say, you know, I've always been somewhat intimidated by you, but now you have a, a entirely different demeanor, and I feel much, you're much more approachable, and I feel much more comfortable uh, working together with you. And so he, he really considered his depression, even though it was a dreadful experience to go through, as God's gift to him, that he grew him through it, which is what the book of James is telling us. He says that, Book of James is saying um, he uses the Greek word hupomenon, which means to remain under. He says that we might pray that we would remain under uh, the the pain and difficulties we're going through until God has completed His teaching in us. That's a very difficult thing to do because now, normally we just want out, and that's how we pray. You know, get us out from underneath this pain and and uh, and difficulty we're experiencing. But but James uh, suggested that we pray that God would give us the emotional and physical strength to remain under it until he's completed his work in us. And I think that's, uh, that's a great challenge, and it's much more difficult than it sounds oftentimes. Last uh, couple of minutes, uh, in the final section of your book, uh, Dr. Lovejoy, you provide practical steps that help people to get their lives back on track. Uh, give us some of the suggestions that uh, you make. Yes, um, you, there, we make quite a few different suggestions during that, but I think the one I will comment on is, uh, is the, uh, the whole idea of need language versus preference language in, a, in terms of our internal dialogue. We cannot not think. We think 100% uh, of the time we're awake and aware, and we're thinking right now. And, um, and that 
it's like a narrative that's going on in our head at all times, making comments about the events that we experience every day. And if we use need language, um, and you say, well, what is need language? That's language related to a need. That is something necessary for survival, like need for food, need for water, need for air, need for shelter, and so forth. There are very, very few needs, actually. And whenever we do that, it greatly uh, exacerbates, exacerbates the emotion around it. For example, if, I, uh, if, a, if a, need is, a true need is being thwarted, if, if you're being blocked from air, getting air, like a person who's drowning, they, what do they do? They panic. If someone yells fire in the middle of the theater, people panic and run for the, for the exits. Uh, panic is the normal response when a need is being thwarted. Well, what happens if I psychologically convert something that's really a want, such as I want your approval, and I psychologically in my head convert it into a need? In other words, it becomes like essentially a pseudo need. And I think I need your approval. Well, what if you don't? You give signs you don't give me your approval. I will panic and I will do the exact same thing. I will become distraught and I will do anything, sometimes even compromise my values to get your approval. And so, and if I don't, I fail to get it, I will sink into despair and depression and so forth. Uh, this is what happens when we think in terms of need language as opposed to preference language. Whereas uh, preference language says, I'm disappointed, but it's not the end of the world, and, uh, and I will look for uh, approval elsewhere. In other words, I don't catastrophize about it, and therefore I'm at peace. And the Apostle Paul discovered the power of the distinction between need language and preference language uh, in um, a, a passage that is, uh, sometimes people are familiar with and some people are not, and that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. And people were naturally able to ask him, well, how do you keep your head above water, Paul? You go through, you know, you're thrown in rat fed in pris uh, prisons, you're mocked by people, you're rejected by people you have evangelized, and so forth. So he said, how do you make it through that emotionally? And um, so undoubtedly people had asked him this question, and he slips this into this passage, which is powerful, and he says this, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Now you can see what he's doing here. He's using preference language as opposed to need language. He says we're afflicted in every way, of course. I mean, it's not... Uh, uh, you know, pie in the sky thinking, but he said, but we're not crushed, and crushed is a, is a emotionally loaded uh, uh, need language word. Uh, we're perplexed. Sometimes we don't understand how God is working, but we're not driven to despair, which is, again is need language term. Uh, we're persecuted, which is simply a statement of fact, but not forsaken, which is, again, a need language term. And then we're struck down, meaning we get discouraged sometimes, but we're not destroyed. So what basically the Apostle Paul was saying is, I have learned, which he said in Philippians 4, he says, I learned to be content. And he says, I've learned to be content. How did I do that? I learned to use need language. I mean, I use preference language as opposed to need language. When I used need language, I was a train wreck. I was constantly upset, constantly going after people, having arguments and so forth. But I mellowed through my years. God mellowed me because I came to realize that preference language was what God wanted me to use, and calm, it kept me calm under difficult situations, as opposed to use need language to describe those things to myself, which only emotionally exacerbated uh, the, uh, the, the experience. And so uh, this is a, a tremendous, I think, affirmation from the Apostle Paul that uh, using preference language is much more preferable than, uh, than using need language in helping us emotionally uh, process through the events of our life, including the adverse ones. Not only is it important to seek professional help, but the help does begin by asking the Lord to lead, guide, and direct us in our lives, uh, whether whether you know Him, if you ask Him to help you, of course you will do that, but if you don't know Him, that's a great place to start, and Doctor, we want to give our listeners right now in our last uh, moment or two an opportunity to ask Jesus Christ into their heart if they don't know Him as their Lord and Savior. Would you graciously lead us in that prayer? Absolutely. I'd be happy to. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray, Lord, that in, in this world in which we encounter so many difficulties and hardships and adversity, we just pray, Lord, that, that uh, those out there who are listening who are struggling with these things and yet do not know you and do not find the comfort that is found in their faith in Jesus Christ, we just pray, Lord, that you would soften their heart, that you would open their heart and 
and uh, so that they might invite you in and discover that the Prince of Peace brings that peace, that his promise is fulfilled, and begin to realize that there is more to life than just what meets the eye, but rather is the depth of um, God's love in their lives. So, Lord, we just pray that you would give them that wisdom and understanding and grow them through their experience that they might come to serve you and, uh, and enjoy the fruits of their labors through Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the time that we can be together and talk about these things and are reminded of your undying love for us. Thank you for these things now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our guest on Second Chances has been Dr. Gary H. Lovejoy, author of Light in the Darkness, Finding Hope in the Shadow of Depression. Real quick, Dr. Lovejoy, the website that one could visit to learn more about uh, you, your work, and also places the book is available. Uh, yes, it's uh, depressionoutreach.com is our website, and a uh, place where you can uh, purchase the book would be either amazon.com, uh, would be in many of the bookstores, including book, uh, Barnes & Noble and uh, all the Christian bookstores, um, and then also at WPH Online, that's uh, Wesleyan Publishing House uh, official line, online.com. Uh, uh, that also that is also their product line, and you can buy it directly from the publisher that way. So these are the ways that you can purchase the book, and hopefully it will be helpful to you in your life and in strengthening your your faith in Christ. Our guest on Second Chances, Dr. Gary H. Lovejoy, the author of Light in the Darkness, Finding Hope in the Shadow of Depression. Tune in next week for more Second Chances right here from Advantage Radio Ministries on Lift FM.